Right. Nice to see you again. Could I get you to turn to Second uh, Peter or First Peter chapter five? First Peter chapter five. Now last week we just began a wee bit of a study along the idea of the Apostle Paul sitting in his prison cell, the end is near, looking back on his life, and he just wants us to know that he had fought a good fight. And uh, we as believers, whether we like it or not, we're in the army. We're in a spiritual fight. And every aspect of our existence flows into that spiritual conflict, just the way that it is. Um, if you go home tonight on the way home, you crash the car and you get yourself a broken leg, uh, that's going to have a spiritual impact. If you go to your work tomorrow and the boss calls you in and he says, I'm sorry, things are bad, you're fired, you've lost your job. With all the economic impact of that, it has a spiritual impact. So we're always going to be um, contending with spiritual conflict in one way or another. And I want you to take a wee look at this wee verse here. We were thinking about, you know, who is it we're in the ring with? And we have to make sure that we're not in the ring uh, engaged in a torturous struggle with our brother and sister in Christ. And now sometimes, as we said, we just accidentally hurt one another. Maybe by what we say, what we do, we had no intention to hurt, but just the way things are, that we can hurt one another. But not deliberately. We don't go out of a way to hurt our brother and sister in Christ. Uh, look at this wee verse here, and this tells us who it is we're actually in the ring with. First Peter chapter 5, and go down to verse 8. It says uh, in verse 8, uh, be sober and be vigilant. That's simply saying as believers, uh, have your eyes open. Have the brain switched on. Uh, don't go through life like an idiot. Understand there are dangers out there, spiritually. So be sober and be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, You don't have to guess the enemy there. It's telling you. The word of God is simply saying as believers, there's your adversary. It's there. It's not your brother and sister in Christ. It's that fellow there, your adversary, clearly identified. And who is he? Your adversary, that devil. And they don't understand something of that reality, he says, as a roaring lion, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We have to contend with the wolves. Sheep amongst the wolves. Here, Peter's saying, it's not just the wolves you have to keep an eye on. You have to watch out for the lion, the devil. And how does the devil work? Well, in, I want you to turn to Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 16. And we'll just get a wee bit of a, a, a case history, put it that way, of how the devil works. But in Ephesians chapter 6 and uh, verse 11, it talks there about the wiles of the devil. The wiles. And, and that's just the, the, the strategies. You see, if you think of the, 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 the Chinese, they are supposedly our growing enemy. And all the commentary and the TV and the politicians, and, 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 and they're looking at China now, and they're, they're growing economically, and, and look at the military they have, and... And, and what sort of strategies will they have to devour us? 
their economic system, their, their military strength, what they're doing through misinformation, through social media, it's all being used, maybe to turn us in against each other, and while we're busy fighting one another, they're surrounding us to come in for the kill. The strategies of the enemy, and the devil's no different. The strategies of our adversary, the devil, like a ruling lion. So here we are in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, and it just lets you see something about the ways of the devil. It says here, chapter 16, uh, take a look at verse 23. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So he says to the disciples, You fellows, you're out there amongst the people, and, and I know they're all talking about me. And the where, you know, someone came to our wee country, or sort of rose up in our wee country, and started doing miracles. It's being the headlines, the Belfast Telegraph. And it would be there on News at 6. The, the cameras would be there to interview the people that saw the miracle and, and how did it happen and, and they'd follow this man around and, and Jesus, he, he's sort of causing waves and ripples and, and people are talking about him and, and so Jesus says to the disciples, with your ear to the ground, who do these people think I really am? I, I, I'm the, the son of man. Uh, I, they, they see and they understand my humanity. But uh, do they talk to me in terms other than me being the son of man? And here's what Peter said. Or the, the disciples. And they said, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say you're uh, Elisha, another Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. They say they certainly are talking about you. There's discussions going on in the market square. There's discussions going on in people's homes. And you're the subject of the conversation and they're trying to figure out. And some say you're John the Baptist and some say you're uh, Elisha and Elijah and Jeremiah and this prophet and, and that prophet. All come back from the dead. You're one of them. And Jesus says, that's interesting. But then he turns to the disciples and he says to them, uh, and he said unto them, verse 25, or verse 15, sorry, uh, but whom say ye that I am? Hey, what about you fellas, you disciples? Peter, what about you? John, Thomas, Nathaniel. Uh, you, you've been alongside me you've been listening to my ministry you've seen my miracles it is time for you guys to put your cards on the table who do you think I am? just the son of a carpenter? a prophet? a priest? who? and Peter steps forward a big smileless face conviction in his heart and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. A garden one. Now, go down to verse 21. Now that they knew who Jesus was, they had to try and understand why Jesus, the Son of God, was here on the earth. What was his purpose? What was his mission? What did he come to do? And from that time forth, the moment they discovered who Jesus was, from then on, it says, he began to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and be killed and be raised again. He says, now that you know who I am, you need to know why I'm here. And it's all going to happen in Jerusalem, so let's pack our bags. Now it's time to head to Jerusalem. And I'm going to let you know what's going to happen when we get there. I will be arrested. 
and then they'll be brutalized and then eventually I will be nailed to a cross, I'll be crucified, I will be put to death. Don't worry about it. Three days later, I will rise from the dead. But that last wee bit, I think they were so stunned when Jesus says, and be killed. They never got the last wee bit. You're the son of God, and we're all here in Jerusalem, and you're going to be arrested, and you're going to be killed. We can't have that. And what does Peter say? And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. <laughs> the brass neck of it when you think of it. This is the one who just discovered you are the son of God. Now let me tell you, son of God, well, none of this nonsense of you heading off to Jerusalem to be killed. It's such a contradiction in terms. But that's what Peter said. Now, look what it says. And uh, he went on to say, Be it far from thee, this shall not be unto thee. No Lord saying, uh, we're going to stop it. Uh, verse 23, But he turned and he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me. What? Satan. Oh. Had the devil made an appearance? I thought it was just Jesus and the disciples. But Jesus says, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, uh, my daily paper is the Daily Mail. And uh, sometimes, the, the, it used to be almost every Saturday for about a year, the, the magazine had had a very interesting picture on it. It was like a carpet. You know what a carpet's like? It only square inch. There's a wee design there, but it's duplicated all the way across and all the way down. Just uh, uh, sort of make you a wee bit dizzy looking at it. It's just that kind of a, you know, all the same. And so here's this picture, a, a, a wee image duplicated all the way across and all the way down, but you're told... If you've got the eye to see it, there's a three-dimensional picture in there that's not so obvious, but it's there. So what you have to do is, you've got to hold it up. And look at it like you're looking at a shop window. When you look in a shop window, you're not looking at the glass. Your eye is trying to look beyond the glass. You don't see the glass. You're looking beyond to see what's on display. So, it might take a wee minute or two. Sometimes you have to go almost like skelly head as we cross-eyed. And then you begin, Hey, I see it. It's a fella in a set of skis coming down the mountain. It's a crocodile coming out of a swamp. I see it. You just need the eye to see it. Do you think Satan wanted the Lord Jesus to die upon that cross. Of course not. That was the mission. And the devil's job was to try and, and stop the mission. We, we got to stop the Lord Jesus from going to Jerusalem and die upon a cross because through his death millions will get right with God. We've got to stop it. We've got to stop the atonement. And the devil's thinking, how can I stop it? Oh, there's a big idiot disciple called Peter, but brash and rash and doesn't think too deeply. I'll use him. It's the whales, the devil. And Peter was used by the devil. Now, look at verse 23. He goes on to say, And he turned and he said unto Peter, Thou art, uh, uh, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offence to me. It's the word offence. It actually means a trap stick. A trap stick. Just a stick. Uh, uh, associated with a trap. Now when I was a wee lad back in Mackerfelt, we used to catch wee birds. And the way we did it, we, we, we put together an apparatus. We sneaked into the house, 
where there was open fire on the fire guard, just a wire mesh, keep the sparks from flying out and setting the house on fire. So we take that out, prop it up with a trap stick in the garden. And then you put some wee bits of bread underneath and tie a string to the trap stick and wind it into the house, maybe in through the window, and you'd, you'd stand there waiting for the wee silly birds to fly around there. And they see the bread and they say there's a fish down there. Wow. Let's go and get those lovely crumbs. And while they go in to get the crumbs, I pull the string, the string pulls the trap stick, and down comes the guard, the trap, the wee bird is caught. See, Jesus had the eye to see it. Well, the disciples didn't. They just one dimensional. Jesus, the Son of God, wants to go and die upon Jerusalem. We can't have it. No, no, no. Oh, we don't want that to happen. We love him. We, we, we care for this man. And if he's a Son of God, why, why would we stand by and let him be, be killed? He said, we, we won't let the soldiers kill you. They didn't understand. That's why Jesus came. He came to die. The devil didn't want him to die. And the devil was there to use Peter as we trap stick to snare the Lord Jesus. But of course the Lord Jesus was too smart. He had the eye to see it. Peter didn't see it. Peter, in all his sincerity, he didn't see it. Now, I want you to take your Bible and come with me to uh, uh, first, uh, Second Samuel chapter 16. Yeah, we'll look at it this way. Second Samuel 16. Now, in Second Samuel chapter 16, uh, what you have, uh, it's the, the after effects of a civil war. Civil war was between Saul and David. And uh, Saul was out of favor with God. And David was in favor with God. God was on David's side. Now, not everybody saw it that way. Saul understood that. Samuel the prophet understood that. And maybe a few others on the inside, they understood. Uh, that's the voice of God through the prophet Samuel that says, Saul, you're finished because you prayed, you're out. And a replacement is coming along. And David was that replacement. So that narrative is there in the scriptures. We understand that was the true biblical perspective narrative of that recent history. But that's past now. Civil war is nasty. It separates families and communities and, and leaves an awful lot of bitterness and anger behind and wounds on hill. And here's a man with an open wound. Now David himself, he's king, but for a while he's been dethroned by his own son. And it says in verse 5, And when King David came to Barham, Behold, then shall come out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimni, and he came forth, and he cursed still as he came. Now, David and his men are coming down the main street of this wee town. Uh, you may have come alongside David, and you may have said, David, you know, I, I, I would sort of give that wee town a miss. To take it along with it. B better avoid it. Why? There could be trouble there. Because during the Civil War, this sweet town was allied with Saul. And there's a man that lives in that house, in that street. And he's a bitter, angry wee man. And he actually is part of Saul's family circle. And he hates you. And he dreams of the day when he can get revenge against you. He never lets you go. So give that wee town a miss. Go some other way. But David's coming down the main street and the wee man's out cutting the grass and he sees David and it all boils up with him. And it says this. Take a look uh, at verse 6. And he cast stones at David 
and that all the servants of King David and, and all the people and all the mighty men that were on his right hand and on his left. So he's cursing and he's swearing and he's throwing stones. The, the typical welcome you would imagine he would give David when he hated David so much. What does he say? And no said Shemai when he cursed, come out, come out thy body man. And thy man of Belial. He's simply saying, David, you are to blame for all the dead in the civil war. It is your fault. The blood of the civil war is in your hands. You're a son of the devil. I've got to tell you something. Shimei was sincere in that belief. That's the way he read recent history. His man, Saul, was on the throne. And everything seemed like it was okay. And then along comes a wee shepherd boy, wiggles his way into the favor of the palace, becomes a soldier, becomes a general, and then he takes over with a coup. An evil man. That's the way Shimei read it. So let us say if uh, I'm standing talking to you and and Brother John gets up out of his seat and he comes up to me and he takes his hymn book and he smacks me on the head or, or gives me a, a knuckle sandwich right on the nose and, and there's a bit of a blow then takes place. And of course the police will come and they'll take a statement from John and they'll take a statement from me. And, and, and John will give a sincere statement and, and he will put that narrative down in a way that justifies him and condemns me. And he'll be sincere in it. Maybe I may say something that provokes him, that makes him feel as an injustice, he's entitled to strike me back in some way. And I give my sincere statement to the policeman, and, and the policeman's got two statements, and uh, they're in contradiction. And it might take all of you folk to come to the policeman to give the policeman a true perspective. History can be a very messy thing. And sometimes we come in on it, not when it began to figure out who caused it. We come in in the middle of the brawl, the conflict, and, and we're forced to take sides. Or history in Northern Ireland. You take any loyalist off the street or unionist and, well, what's your take of uh, those 30, 40 years of violence and, and this? Oh, the, oh, those nationalists, it, it's all them. And then you take a nationalist off the street and say, well, what's your take of it? Ah, it's all those loyalists. <laughs> and uh, both sincere, but they can't both be right. And, and, and here's a man, he just got the narrative wrong. And sometimes we don't always see the picture. Wherein lies the real truth? From Peter's perspective, he wasn't aware of the devil. He didn't see a trap being constructed. He didn't think of himself as a trap stick. He just saw what was happening. And, and in all sincerity, he says, Lord Jesus, uh, you're the Son of God. We can't have you go to Jerusalem and let those soldiers kill you. We'll, we'll stop them from killing you. They're just not reading the picture right. See, in our world today, and, and communities almost at war with one another because of false narratives. It was about a couple of years ago back in a thing over in a place called Ferguson, Missouri, in the United States. And uh, the police... Uh, They've got a call to say a big, big fella. And he's a big black fella. 17 or 18 years of age. But he's big. Like a big rugby player, we'd say. And he just went into a store and he picked up a big box of cigars and he just marched out with them. And he'd known to have done that sort of thing. He's a big fella. Nobody pick a fight with him. He'd just walk into a shop and just, you know. And so the guy that owned the shop phones the police, the police arrive, and he was clearly identified, and the police called him over, and there was a struggle in the car, he was trying to get the policeman's gun. 
but he couldn't. The policeman was able. so he, he then ran, and the policeman was now obligated to try and arrest this guy, not just for stealing, but for trying to get his gun and maybe shoot the policeman. So the policeman gets out of his car and and goes towards the big fella, stops, and then he charges the policeman to get the gun. The policeman has to shoot him, and he shot him, and he shot him dead. That's when all this rioting all began in Ferguson, Missouri. And here's what happened. You see, he had a fellow colleague uh, that was on the crime with him. And immediately when the cameras appeared, the journalists, he told them that this young innocent black man had his hands up to the policeman and said, Hands up, don't shoot. And the policeman shot him in cold blood. And the people were angry. And a spray... It's still going today. You'll still hear the chant when the riots are taking place. Hands up, don't shoot. That never happened. It was a narrative. That was a lie. Because what really happened, it went to the grand jury and all the witnesses. It was in a black area of Ferguson. And all the witnesses that saw it were all black from that local community. And they all said the same thing. The policeman's narrative was the one of truth. He didn't have his hands up. He didn't say don't shoot. He was making a roost of the policeman's gun. And the policeman had to shoot him to protect his own life. But the narrative, the lie, it was there. When round the whole of America... And cities across America, the cities were on fire. Because they thought the policemen were just shooting black people down like dogs. Narratives. And sometimes we want to believe a narrative to be true because of our own bias and our own prejudice. But sometimes you've got to sit and think, what really did happen? And maybe I will never know what really happened and who said what and who did what. And, and I'm not going to be dragged into some sort of a conflict that I do not understand. Stand back from it. I may be given life to a, a narrative that's not based upon truth. So when we read, sometimes there's things there you just can't see. The wiles of the devil. The strategies, the false narratives, and here was Shimnai, and I believe something to be true that was not true. David was not responsible for the civil war, Saul was, but Shimnai didn't read it that way, didn't understand it that way. He thought David was the one responsible, not his man Saul. Now, when you turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation, and it's chapter 12. And uh, we were saying about the lion, uh, the wiles of the devil, the, the roar of the lion. Uh, but here is a, a wee thing about the lion. And it is the roar. The roar of the lion. See, the devil's got a good roar. And he wants you to be impacted spiritually by that roar. What is the nature of that roar? So Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1 says, uh, Of course, this lets you know the church is well embedded in heaven. This is up after the rapture. You have the churches of Asia, the church on the earth, and then the rapture, churches in heaven. And, and here we are, believers, well in constant heaven. It says, 12 verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. That woman uh, is Israel. And you read the story on through and that becomes clear away later on. And it says in verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a, a red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon her head. Now take a look at verse 7, and it lets us know who the dragon is. And there was war in heaven between Michael and his angels, as they fought, 
against the dragon. And the dragon fought with the angels. Now you take a look at verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole earth, the whole world, and it was cast out upon the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. So this is the devil still having access to heaven. And there's going to be a bit of a war in heaven in the future. And you're going to be there, I'll be there, and, and I think I'll make start to chant. Throw them out, throw them out, throw them out. And there's going to come a wonderful moment when there's a war in heaven and God's going to take the dragon, the devil, Satan, and he's going to be cast out. Now, I, I, I have questions about, like, God allows Satan even today to have access to his presence and, you know, create war in heaven, but that maybe is one of the reasons why there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, because maybe uh, the original heaven is somehow defiled by the presence of Satan. I, I, those things are beyond my comprehension. It just niggles me, you know. But here's what I want you to see. Look at verse 10. And I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of God, and the power of Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. That's the roar of the lion. He's the accuser, the brethren. Not it? You see, while I'm standing here tonight, the devil's standing in heaven, and he's talking to God about me. And he's probably talking to God about you as well. He's saying, God, you see that fell in the pulpit there? What a hypocrite. Yeah, let me tell you what that fellow's really like. Let me tell you about his life. And you know something? Uh, he, he doesn't even have to lie about me. I mean, just if he sticks to the truth, it's bad enough about me. Uh, in fact, uh, I could give the, the devil some information as well because there's some things about me even the devil wouldn't even know. But only God knows. And he stands before God and he accuses me before God's throne. He says, God, that fellow shouldn't be in your heaven. He shouldn't uh, be in your family. Throw him out of heaven. Yeah. Now, what's God's response to that? Now, take a wee look at verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood the lamb. And the devil, he'll sort of slide up to you and say, you sitting there reading your Bible? You? You look at the stuff you're involved in yesterday. You, you, you going to go to church this week? Going to break bread? You? With all the, the sinfulness of your life? How dare you? And, and, and he'll, let me think he's right, you know. All the sins of my life. What right do I have to stand and preach the word of God or to break bread or to sing his praises? How do I overcome without sort of succumbing to the, the guilt of that and the defeat of that? The blood of the Lamb. I say to the devil, of course everything you say about me is true. Can I point you to a hillside? To appoint you to a cross. Hey devil, do you not know what happened there? Jesus died for me. All the sins of my life, all your accusations against me, Jesus died for them. That's how you overcome the accusatory roar of the lion. You appoint him to the cross. The book of Esther, just in closing. The book of Esther. Um, it's not the, the easiest one, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. But chapter 3, a wee fella called uh, Haman, he's been promoted 
in the work environment. The king thinks she's uh, worth promotion. He's advanced. And chapter 3, verse 1 says, And after these things did uh, Ahasuerus promote Haman and uh, advanced him and, and set his seat above the princes that were with him. So this man is now elevated. He's now a gaffer. He's now on the staff of the company, as it were. He's a boss. And the king sends out a wee memo amongst all the other workforce. From this day on, you show this man respect. When he comes in, you stand up, you curtsy, you tip, you bow yourself. You show him reverence. That's the king saying that. But uh, look what it says in verse 2. And all the servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman for the king had so commanded but Mordecai bowed not nor did him reverence this wee stubborn Jewish man says I went to school that fella uh, he was never anything if anybody deserved the promotion I should have got it discrimination racism who knows what he thought but he says I'm not going to bow myself to him for whatever reason. I, I, I got the memo from the king. I understand. I know what the king wants, but the king's not going to get it. I will not bow myself to that man. I will not show him respect. No. Won't do it. So how does Haman respond to that? He goes to the king. Take a look at verse 8. And Haman said unto king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed amongst the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people. May they keep the king's law. Therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. So that's his response. He says, I'll get my revenge on this wee Jewish man. And not just him, his family, his Jewish community. I'll, I'll wipe them out. And to do that, I've got to go to the king and turn the king's heart against him. And them. You see, that's the devil, isn't it? He goes to God and he says, God, let me tell you about these people sitting in Bali, selling Gospel Hall. They're a bunch of hypocrites. There's all kinds of sin amongst them. You should destroy them. Send them off to judgment. There's not a thing that the devil can say about me that'll turn God's heart against me. Because he so loved me, he sent his son to die for me. And I just look at the cross and all the doubts of my salvation are gone. I realize he loved me and he died for me and there's not an accusation the devil can lay before heaven that's going to stand. What does Romans 8 say? Who shall lay any charge against God's elect. Well, well, well I, I can't do it because, you see, whenever it comes to our, our accusation of one or the other, um, if I stand and I say, God, let me tell you something about John, God says, well, let's see if you have any proper standing to do that. The principle is, he that is without sin can cast the first stone. So then God will say, well, you, have you committed any sins yourself? And I have to stand there and say, I'm afraid, God, too many. He says, well, then, you have no standing to point a finger at him. Neither he against you. What standing does the devil have to accuse me of sin? He has no standing before God doesn't listen to him. And we as believers do not listen to the accusatory Rule of the lion. He's no standing before God. God just tolerates it for some uh, sovereign purpose that's beyond my understanding. Someday God might let us know. But I'm going to be there to cheer him up. Take the devil and throw him out of heaven. He should never have been there in the first place. Let's have a wee word of prayer. And then I'll hand over to yourselves for your, your own day of prayer. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his determination to get a Jerusalem and die upon a cross. 
And the devil couldn't stop it. Even by using the sincerity of Peter, he failed in his enterprise. The Lord Jesus got to Jerusalem. He was killed. He died for sin. And he rose again the third day. Father, we bless you for the blood of the Lamb. It helps us to silence the accusations of the devil. Help us, our Father, never to listen to those accusations. But even when we do hear them, to always look at the cross and see the place where sins were paid for. Accept it for thanks. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you.